Chapter 3, From Jim Crow to Mudtown. Look at me as a little boy, five years old, playing in the barn. Look at my family on their farm in southern Louisiana, working in the fields till the fingers bleed. See my father sail for the South Seas to fight the Japanese. Listen to the South sing Dixie as the crosses burn and the strange fruit swings. And look at my mother as she holds my hand as we board the colored car of a westbound train in search of the future. And every time I tell this tale, someone says to me, that's my family you're talking about. That's my story. Born of the South, flight from Jim Crow, California dreams, stark awakenings, struggle, injustice, violence, rage. This is our story. It's not about saints' lives, just ordinary folks striving for something better and what they have been forced to endure. It's about the decisions we make when shut in dark places. This is my story. I am the oldest of Ibora Alexander's 11 children, born in Iberia, Louisiana, on January 4th, 1941. Located on the banks of Bayou Teach, southwest of Baton Rouge, New Iberia sits in the heart of Cajun country. Established by the Spanish in 1779 as Nueva Iberia, the town soon became known for a mix of Indian, Spanish, French, and African cultures. Its history, marked by Union occupation, Mississippi floods, yellow fever, and nearly a century of Jim Crow segregation, today New Iberia is famous for its swamps, hot sauce, and jungle gardens. Antebellum estates with sprawling lawns, live oaks, and Spanish mosh highlight the region. Yearly, New Iberia hosts the World Championship Gumbo Cook-Off, the Cajun Hot Sauce Festival, and the Great Gator Race. In the Sugar Festival, representatives from all of Louisiana's parishes compete for the title of Sugar Queen. Traditional dishes of New Iberia include jambalaya, corn mac chowsh, and sweet potato casserole with praline topping. The Tabasco Sauce Factory operates on nearby Avery Island. The town is home to the writer James Lee Burke's fictional detective, Dave Ribichow. My first memories of the South involved the old farm, how my father tended to a pregnant mare, performed a C-section, delivered the colt, then stitched the mother back up with yarn, applying juice from chewing tobacco to help heal the wound. I also recall the slaughterhouses where cows and pigs were butchered and how my relatives soaked their blistered hands in milk after picking peppers all day. Above all, I remember the fact that every year there were more and more babies. My father was one of 16 children each of whom in turn averaged another 10 kids apiece. An Alexander family reunion was a town unto itself. I was also told tales of a legendary great-grandfather, a militant family guardian who was said to stalk his enemies deep into the Louisiana swamps. My grandfather, King Alexander, owned the farm and was a pastor for the AME, or African Methodist Episcopal Church. King possessed the most valued African trait, he had presence. One simply felt his authority. He didn't need to say a word, and he was old school, meaning Old Testament, sworn to take an eye for an eye and a life for a life. Justice was simple, absolute, and inevitable. If someone did you wrong, you did them back, and the quicker the better. If you had to wait, you did. There was no statute of limitations on vengeance. Sooner or later, the wrong would be righted. This code was rooted deep in our past, carried by ancestors from West Africa, from Haiti, through the Carolinas, passed from generation to generation, from king to my father, then down to me. In a culture of dueling and vengeance, the children were trained early in self-defense and in weapon use. There was no misunderstanding the message, fight and never quit. It was imbued in me. You will have to fight forever, my father said, the rest of your life. And with this message came a fire, a built-in sense of anger and rage. I felt cursed with the genetic family temper and burdened by the duty to keep it under control. Behave or you will bury me, went another family saying. My father, Kermit Sr., and my mother, Ibora, married in 1940. Kermit Sr. was a mechanic, a boxer, a horse trainer, and soon-to-be serviceman. Ibora was 15 and soon to be a mother. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Kermit Sr. enlisted in the armed forces and traveled to Camp Mont Ford Point, 
in Jacksonville, North Carolina. There, he would become one of the legendary Montford Point Marines, the first blacks to join the Marine Corps. As with the famous Buffalo Soldiers of the Army or the Tuskegee Airmen, the Montford Point Marines earned the Congressional Gold Medal, theirs for valor in battling the Japanese in the South Pacific. My father joined the Marines for two reasons. The first was he wanted to fight. At the time, blacks joining the Army landed in support service roles as janitors and cooks, in the Navy as stewards. And this didn't change even following Pearl Harbor. During the attack, Dory Miller, a black soldier, sheltered his wounded captain, manned a machine gun, and defended the USS West Virginia. Miller received the Medal of Honor. He was the first American hero of World War II, but blacks were still denied combat. My father wanted action and refused to be treated like a slave. His second reason for joining the military was that he had to leave town. He was wanted by the Klan. During the war, the Montfort Point Marines gained a reputation for ruthlessness. As what were called tunnel rats, it was their job to clean out the underground mazes harboring Japanese soldiers who refused to surrender. On islands like Iwo Jima and Okinawa, defoliated graveyards with none left living above ground, my father and his fellow Marines hunted the subterranean survivors. On islands like Iwo Jima and Okinawa, defoliated graveyards with none left living above ground, my father and his fellow Marines hunted the subterranean survivors. The few remaining Japanese buried deep in the tunnels finally raised their hands in forfeit when confronted by these dark-skinned Marines. Legend has it they thought that they were some kind of ghosts or ghouls. After the war, Kermit Sr. returned to Louisiana where he sought to buy some land, build a home, and run an auto shop. When the local real estate agent left him waiting all day long, then told him there was no land for sale, he knew he had to move on. Overseas, he had risked his life for his country. He felt like a hero. Back home, he felt like he didn't exist. He was going to take control and escape Jim Crow. For a black in the segregated South, the most routine task was made a degrading challenge. The constant dishonor drove him mad. Where can I go to the bathroom, buy lunch, get a drink of water? Everything was restricted, off limits, blocked. Color this, white that, waiting rooms, swimming pools, lunch counters, park benches. And if a white woman walked by, boy, you better keep off the sidewalk and stare at the ground or else. And after fighting for his country in its most brutal theater of war, in the epic battle against tyranny, his own hometown couldn't grant him a timely meeting, made him sit for hours just to tell him, no, we don't have any land for you. Fight for freedom abroad to get denied at home. An ancient traveler through Africa once said he had met no people with less tolerance for injustice. Justice makes a man. He'd had it. Throughout the war, black servicemen fought the double battle. Double V was When there was no V to be had in the South, Kermit Sr. joined millions of blacks in the Great Migration, heading for the industrial centers of the North and West. In 1946, he left his new family which now included me and my two baby sisters, back in Louisiana, as he caught a train west to California in search of a new life. His sudden departure had them talking back to the bayou. What was he running away from? After less than a year, my father found work as a mechanic in Los Angeles and sent for the family. Maddie, my aunt Eldora, my sisters Barbara and Mary Ann, and I followed him west by train. Through the bayou, the cypress forests of Louisiana, and the vast stretches of Texas, we rolled the segregated car. Denied access to the dining room, we ate our packed lunches. I can still taste the homemade fried chicken, still feel the orange peel breaking apart beneath my fingers. To this day, my sister Mary talks about those oranges. The journey sparked for her a lifetime love of trains, and no trip could begin without a fresh bag of her favorite fruit. For me, the cross-country train ride was like a party as we ran around the car, played with the porters, and watched the planes speed by. It felt magical. I didn't quite just get where we were going, making the adventure all the more exciting. For my family, like many black migrants, trains would remain forever emotional, symbols of freedom, escape, and the future. When we reached the Texas-New Mexico border, we waved goodbye to Jim Crow. The segregated cars of the South were abandoned as we continued west to California. Even as a little kid, I remember sensing something special occurring, awaiting a moment of arrival. 
When the train reached downtown Los Angeles, it pulled into the new Union Station. I'd never seen anything like it. The high ceilings, the chandeliers, the shiny marble floors. I felt tiny. And when I looked around, all I saw were black people, families like ours reunited, children and wives rushing into the arms of fathers and husbands. No eyes stayed dry. In California, opportunities for blacks were better than back in the South, and my father soon had steady work as both a mechanic and as a horse trainer at the Santa Anita racetrack. From the time my parents reunited in Los Angeles, they would have eight more children. Like my family, most blacks found discrimination less oppressive in the West. One could vote without fear and earn better wages. In LA, blacks could shed what poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar called the mask, that veil of racial inferiority and servility mandated by Jim Crow society. So blacks from Texas and Louisiana, as well as other ex-Confederate states, flocked to Los Angeles in the years in and after World War II, greatly changing the city's makeup. In 1939, LA's black population numbered less than 40,000. By 1960, it neared half a million. As their numbers grew, so did tensions and doubts. Some blacks began to wonder whether California could live up to its dream. Many of the problems they fled dogged them thousands of miles to the west, in particular housing. Through the use of various tactics, redlining, blockbusting, and restrictive covenants, banks, lenders, real estate agents, and sellers managed to limit black access to real estate, confining them to certain parts of town. Black resentment began to simmer, and the indignation was not just directed at whites, but increasingly turned inward as the struggle for limited housing intensified. Black families established in Los Angeles for decades, considering themselves urban and sophisticated, resented the constant flood of newcomers, country home lately's, and uncouth hicks. Thus, within the broader racial dynamic emerged an internal competition, one focused upon the date of departure, with the earlier migrants looking down on later arrivals. The initial housing destination for blacks in World War II was an area known as Little Tokyo, a Japanese enclave in downtown LA. Following Pearl Harbor and Intermint, the area vacated overnight. Buddhist temples turned into Baptist storefronts. Japanese storefronts became squatters havens. The black presence became so heavy, the district was renamed Bronzeville. However, as the Great Migration accelerated during and after the war, more and more blacks settled on the east side of the city south of downtown. Here, in a part of what would come to be known as South Central Los Angeles called Watts, my father settled our family. Originally called Mudtown in 1900, the district was renamed after the Watts family that donated the land for a turn of the century railroad station. In the 20s, Watts was incorporated into LA. Initially white in the wake of the Great Migration, Watts quickly turned into a black part of town. The large black population was why Los Angeles annexed Watts as the city council feared that an independent Watts would elect a black mayor. Running through Watts is the Central Avenue Corridor, a famous site of black culture known as the Great Black Way or Harlem West. When we first arrived, my father drove us down the Central Avenue Strip. As a boy who had known only the rural South, it blew my mind. Bright colored lights and the strange sounds storefront churches with preachers barking salvation, dandies with shoes shined like mirrors reflecting the neon above, and the music of Central Avenue, a new kind of jazz changing from boogie woogie and swing to bop, even more dissonant, angular angry. Those sounds, those lights, those voices, come and see, the end time is near. Flashes, screams, sirens, jarring chords, it was startling, alluring, a new and unknown world. Later as a teenager, I would ride my bicycle up Central Avenue. Too young to get into the clubs, I still listen as the notes escape through an open door. The sounds of Kid Ory, Dexter Gordon, Lionel Hampton, and Charles Mingus. At home, my parents would spin their records on the phonograph, push all the furniture to the edges of the living room, and we would have our own Club Alexander, where family and friends danced into the late night. 